so uh, like uh, Lotta alluded to, uh, talking about how we can leverage microstructural and mineralogical complexity to understand serpentinite behavior. Uh, so uh, just to quickly go over what I'll be discussing in the, in the talk, I'll start with some motivation that may or may not be necessary in this sort of context, but just to set the stage, we'll then look at what this complexity is within the serpentine group of minerals, uh, and then ultimately who should care about it, why should you care, and perhaps what to do about it uh, in some to some extent. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll share uh, a little bit of research that I'm doing on trying to decipher some of the steady state behaviors of large serpentinite shear zones, looking at this micro mineralogical and structural complexity. So this motivation, like I alluded to, is pro probably not necessary in this context, but as a structural geologist, the reason I'm really keen on serpentinites is that we find them in some of the most important geodynamic settings in the world. Subduction zones, transform faults, ophiolites, mid-ocean ridges, they're sort of everywhere in these really important tectonic settings, and often they're a major or even a dominant rock type. And so understanding how serpentinites deform is understanding the rheology of some of these settings. And the serpentine mineral groups themselves, you're probably very familiar with them, or at least to some extent, they're these hydrous magnesium phyllosilicates, chock full of water, about 13 weight, weight percent. Uh, we have our low temperature serpentines nominally. These are the main serpentine minerals, lizardite and chrysotile. Uh, and then we have our nominal high temperature antigorite. And we'll look at these minerals and sort of what their presence and uh, context tells us about sort of uh, either processes or local conditions. Uh, let's get antigorite out of the way. Uh, and the reason for that is if there was a well-behaved serpentine mineral, it would be antigorite. It's this corrugated crystal structure. Um, it typically forms by either prograde replacement of previous serpentines or really just high temperature serpentinization. And most typically 300 to 600 degrees, uh, though it can in certain contexts form a little lower. Now these uh, photomicrographs on the right that you're seeing, this is sort of classic prograde metamorphic uh, antigorite with an interpenetrating or in the older literature, you'll also hear it being described as thorny antigorite. And as far as mineralogical and microstructural complexity, it's in fact quite low. These rocks can sometimes be monomineralic. And often there's like a dusting of chrysotile here and there. Um, the mineral grains are fairly large, hundreds of microns, sometimes even in the millimetric range. Uh, and we can use our classic techniques of microstructure uh, analysis, like electron backscatter diffraction, to get the crystallographic orientation moderately easy on these serpentinites. So they're a bit of an exception. If you're working with antigorite, uh, you might not need to worry so much about the uh, micro mineralogical and structural complexities. The same, however, can not necessarily be said of the other minerals. So chrysotile, we have this rolled cylindrical fiber crystal form. Um, and one of the key things is it's metastable everywhere across the serpentinite PT field. Uh, and so it forms from possibly subambient conditions all the way up to the upper stability limit. And it's not PT space that's really controlling its formation, but instead the local conditions. It forms when there's high levels of fluid supersaturation, high water rock ratios. It's favored when we get rapid kinetically driven growth, and we often find it where there was likely fluid fill voids and pores. When it uh, forms in its beautiful elongate fibrous form, you can see on the top right, we get a rock that you're probably quite familiar with, a spastiform chrysotile. Moving on to lizardite, this is really our classic phyllosilicate within the mineral group. We have these flat platelets, and it forms most typically during early serpentinization. Um, and this is probably related to the fact that it's favored when we get these lower water rock ratios. And it is really indicative, most typically, of sort of equilibrium serpentine growth. In addition to these three main serpentine minerals, we also have some structural arrangements, typically of lizardite-like platelets, either in polygonal uh, sectors forming fibrils known as polygonal serpentine, or even as sort of 
polyhedral orbs where the platelets are arranged in such a way to form a polyhedron. And there's even um, sort of pseudo or, or poorly crystalline forms or even amorphous proto-serpentine gels. So already we can see that there's a bit of complexity and they're poorly constrained, at least the lower temperature serpentine minerals, as to where they're going to form and what's going to lead to that formation. So to appreciate this complexity, let's take a step back and let's go before the serpentine. Uh, just to not have to worry about it, we'll go to a peridotite. So here we have this beautiful coarse grain peridotite. We're dealing with, uh, I think, a Harzbergite. And let's think about complexity. So in terms of number of mineral grains, I think we have about a thousand individual crystals in this thin section. Uh, and we can constrain uh, the composition, the orientation, the crystallographic orientation using, for example, EBSD of every single mineral grain on this slide. So overall, the complexity and the characterization of its microstructure is in relative, relative terms quite simple. Now let's hydrate this peridotite, this bit of Harzbergite. Um, we are, we're going to go from a Harzbergite that has olivine, uh, it has enstatite, and it might have a few spinels, so very low number of minerals. Um, and we're going to hydrate it at low temperatures. And to go easy on you, we'll do this statically. We'll, we'll won't add any deformation. And this is what you'll, you'll get. This is a pseudomorphic serpentinite. You might be able to recognize where there once was um, some of these uh, pyroxenes. These are these grayish lineated domains, which are bastites. If we look a little closer, you can see that these mesh or net-like domains are mesh texture. These replaced olivine. Now, we went from a rock where we could count and physically see every mineral grain to a rock where now the serpentine minerals are probably below a micron. Uh, we went from a thousand, um, went from a thousand mineral grains in this slide. Um, and by my estimate, this is a really difficult back of the envelope calculation, but we've gone between probably between three and five orders of magnitude increase in number of individual crystals of serpentine. So we're now looking at probably a million or more individual mineral grains. So the complexity in terms of mineralogy, in terms of microstructure for a statically serpentinized rock is through the roof. And we can't even see these individual minerals, these individual serpentinites. So it leads to a lot of challenges when we're looking at microstructures and we're trying to relate them to what serpentine uh, types might be present uh, and how and what that tells us about the processes. So, well, I guess this brings us to uh, one of the, the main points of the talk is, well, this complexity, why should you care? Who should care about it? And then ultimately, what do we do about it? How do we deal with it? So uh, I've looked at the sort of the guest uh, list on this, this uh, webinar, and we have a pretty wide range of uh, people here. So I'll try to single uh, some people out professionally, not uh, personally, um, and sort of think about what it means in terms of how you're studying these rocks. So if you're a geophysicist, does it matter? Well, potentially not. If you're interested in seismic anisotropy, uh, this rock is very easy to constrain. This one may not be, but you can possibly assign some bulk properties that might uh, sort of characterize it. You can certainly get the seismic anisotropy of any single mineral, but the arrangement and size in here uh, sort of precludes, um, I would say, simple quantifications. That being said, you might not care in the sense that you can sort of ascribe bulk properties to it. Are you a geochemist? Well, in this case, this probably matters immensely. Uh, if you're studying the isotopic properties of serpentine or perhaps the trace elements or even major element chemistry, you need to know what you're analyzing. And those microstructures are incredibly complex and become increasingly complex as deformation takes place as well as multiple generations of serpentinite. And uh, there's some really wonderful work that was done uh, this year by Céline Martin uh, that demonstrates that even when you can constrain or at least loosely constrain the, um, 
microstructures, that there's no guarantee that you're going to have sort of the same, in this case, isotopic signatures or equilibration. And so microstructures matter. If you're a geochemist, you have to pay attention to what you're analyzing. And I, and I think that goes without saying. Finally, this is this one that really gets me. Are you an experimentalist in rock deformation? Particularly, do you care about the individual serpentine minerals? Like we're here, we're looking at a compilation of frictional strengths, frictional coefficient versus effective normal stress. And it's a mess. The entire field is populated. And the reason is, I, I believe, quite simple, that it's near impossible to differentiate and certainly to isolate any one of these sim single minerals, except for maybe antagorite. And so That's this has led to there being quite a bit of a mess, at least in the frictional strengths of serpentinites. Uh, and so I would suggest that if you're doing these types of experiments, you do need, to, once again, microstructures matter. Uh, and then finally, uh, the perspective of the structural geologists. Well, they've been understudied largely because they're messy, but there's a lot of incredible information that's captured in this complexity. And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today, specifically looking at what we can get at in terms of steady state deformation behavior in serpentinites um, captured by this sort of mineralogical and microstructural uh, context. And there are some pretty serious challenges, especially from someone who's interested in microtectonics, microstructure. Optical microscopy is often kind of useless. You can't identify the individual minerals, except for maybe those antigorites I talked about. XRD can do the job, but you lose your context. TEM is kind of the gold standard. You can identify any serpentine mineral you like, but it's incredibly difficult to maintain your spatial context. So what I've been uh, playing with is combining some of these techniques along with Raman spectroscopy mapping at a submicron level, which allows us to spatially resolve our main serpentine minerals down to about 180 nanometers. And this really gives us some context when we're looking at microstructure and trying to relate them to physical processes of deformation. So we have an example here on the right where we have this beautiful antigorite grain that's breaking down, it's getting replaced by the surrounding chrysotile, as well as a bit of carbonation and hydration that's happening in the form of a pyroorite. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that Raman spectroscopy can highlight and re reveal that would be difficult to see otherwise using other techniques. And so this brings us to, well, my perspective, my uh, study of what this complexity can tell us. Uh, and, and I'm going to be looking specifically at steady state deformation behavior. Now, in order to get at steady state, uh, I'm going to have to take you through a bit of a journey on some work that I've done recently that I've presented in a few, uh, a few contexts. Uh, and we're actually going to move away from steady state and move to transient behavior, looking at first um, brittle deformation in serpentinite, which uh, records some kind of unique processes. So, Often the sign, one of the signs for brittle deformation, a record of it in serpentinites are veins, uh, openings that have been filled with serpentine minerals, so often fibrous. They're pretty ubiquitous in any deformed serpentinite. Uh, and there's a particular serpentinite uh, vein type that I've studied quite extensively, which are crack seal veins. For those of you who are familiar, or for those who aren't familiar, these are veins that form in a context where we repeatedly open space and precipitate serpentine. And this sometimes repeats itself uh, up to thousands or even tens of thousands of times. So here we have a dilational jog. We have this fault um, and then this little space. The, the fault takes a bit of a jog here. And there was repeated slip on this fault. And you can almost just about see these sort of slip increments that occurred here. Uh, and we're going to look at um, the cross-sectional view of this dilational jog. And so we're looking at this in uh, cross-polarized light here, and we get a very classic crack seal vein. So on one side, we have the serpentinized host rock. We have the crack seal increments, which form this beautiful banding throughout. And uh, each band records a single opening event, a crack that was opened, filled with serpentinite, 
healed and then repeated. And in this case, we're looking, I think, at 6,000 repeated events which took place. So an incredible record. This is a ledger of perhaps micro earthquakes or repeated tiny stress drops occurring at law across a fault. So just in that, it's an interesting um, phenomena to study. And so I took a number of these samples and applied that Raman spectroscopy mapping methodologies to it to sort of see if there's anything more to it. Traditionally, these bands, the reason that people uh, have ascribed their existence is that while there's small differences in orientation between the serpentine that grows within them, that delineates the banding. And that's probably true, but what I found by Raman mapping, if we zoom in on one of these domains, we're now looking in reflected light, is that Raman spectroscopy mapping revealed that at a submicron level, we have interlayering of lizardite or lizardite-like serpentine and tiny selvages separating them of chrysotile. So this is really remarkable, and this is found not in all crack seal veins, but in a really large number of them throughout the world. Uh, and the question becomes, well, what's controlling this alternating growth of chrysotile and lizardite? So when we look at chrysotile, it forms where there's fluid supersaturation, lots of water, rapid growth in open space. And this could represent that initial crack opening where that crack seal vein opens up and we just rapidly grow a thin layer of chrysotile from the fluid that infills that space. Following that uh, rapid growth, we then have this slow, more equilibrium growth of lizardites as well as some polygonal serpentine that seals off the crack. And so this is the model that I'd come up with. We open our crack, we, we fill it with fluids, we then rapidly dump our chrysotile out, coating the walls, and then we have this slow polygonal serpentine and lizardite growth. We then seal that crack off, and then we can repeat that process. We can repeat it, um, well, hundreds, thousands, even maybe 10,000 times is the most I've recorded in a single crack seal vein, building up those crack increments. And this is interesting because we now have a record of rapid crack opening. So these bands are not just recording cracks, but we have a sense of timing. The timing aspect is rather poor because the kinetics are not well understood, but at least we know that we almost certainly require uh, a quite a dynamic kinetic event in order to drive that rapid formation of chrysotile. And so with this in mind, uh, I started to wonder, well, what about the steady state behavior? So that was a transient thing that happens really localized to crack seal veins. And you'll notice if you're in a deformed serpentinite, well, crack seal veins don't really make up any very significant amount of the strain, that, or at least the slip that's taking place. Most, Most serpentites in the world uh, have this pervasive anastomosing scaly foliation, low temperature deformed serpentinites. This is a very typical microstructure that we see. We're looking at these packed lenticular domains of serpentine with this through going anastomosing foliation. And here we're looking at examples from the Livingston Fault as well as a, a couple Franciscan bodies, Ring Mountain, as well as Sand Dollar Beach to the south. And they look, there's some slight variations, but they look very similar. In terms of how this fabric forms, the consensus is that we're looking at a macroscopically ductile fabric and that we have this pervasive fabric that formed likely through pressure solution. So we dissolve serpentinite, we reprecipitate, there's abundant fibrous chrysotile veins and slick and fiber surfaces. And it's largely a macroscopically ductile process, maybe with some amount of brittle deformation. Uh, and so what I uh, wanted to do was to have a really closer look to see, well, if Raman spectroscopy could capture any of those processes in that complexity. And so now we're looking at one of these Scalios serpentinites from, in this case, Sand Dollar Beach in California. And uh, here we have a little segment of it. We're looking at it in cross polars in this image here. And what we see is a pretty typical foliated serpentinite. You'll notice the colors in XPL are a little high. This was intentional. It helps highlight some features that otherwise can sort of get drowned out in a sea of blacks and grays and whites. 
And if we have a close look, what we find is that what has been typically described as foliated or anastomosing foliated serpentinite is actually has domains that have a lot of the characteristics of those crack seal domains. Now, it's not obvious where the dilational site was here, but we see banding, banding that looks near identical to those crack seal increments in very classically constrained crack seal uh, fractures and, 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 and veins. And you might not be surprised to hear that by Raman spectroscopy mapping, they consist of alternating bands of lizardite and chrysotile. You have five more minutes. Thank you. And so what we could very well be looking at is distributed microcracking, fracturing, dilational sites within a volume of serpentinite, instead of occurring within some well-constrained localized veinlet, we're dealing with uh, frictional slip occurring within that package of scaly serpentinite. And this, these crack seal veins make up a, a pretty significant portion of this volume. And this is some observations that I've made uh, in not only Sand Dollar Beach, but also Ring Mountain to the north, as well as the Livingston Fault in New Zealand. If we take a little bit of a tour, uh, we can see that they occur. They're a bit chaotic. They're not quite as well organized as our classic crack seal veins, but they occur a bit everywhere in slightly different contexts. Some are recognized like that's probably a crack seal, like cl more classic. We've got sort of slickened fibers on the edge potentially, but they're everywhere. Uh, and they're quite chaotic. They've clearly been brecciated, rotated in some places. They're misaligned to each other in terms of the actual orientations. Some are incredibly subtle. And in fact, in this image, you can't see them all because revealing them requires difficult light conditions. And this rock actually is made up of 45% of crack seal increments. And that really uh, is pretty significant in terms of trying to understand how this serpentinite was deforming. When we look at these bulk serpentinites, which are typically ascribed to sort of pressure solution processes, producing that beautiful anastomosing lenticular foliation, well, that might not be the whole story in many of these cases. If you think about these serpentinites as lentils, let's say, the food that everyone's likely familiar with, imagine sticking your hands in a bag of lentils or a bowl of lentils, grabbing a hold of a bunch and moving them past one another. In order to slide past frictionally, this lenticular shape is going to require some amount of dilation. This is called Reynolds dilatancy. It's been studied. Uh, and in order for that lenticular shape to move past one another, well, there's going to be open space that happens as these lentils climb and bump past one another. And what I would propose is that frictional slip is actually potentially quite an important process and that that slip is actually happening sufficiently rapidly in these sort of episodic incremental processes that we're getting dilation, which is then creating our little crack seal increments, which might repeat some tens, 50, hundreds of times. But then as rotation and rearrangement of the fabric takes place, they become abandoned, they rotate into, uh, into other domains, they sort of create, they get pulled into the fabric and other dilational sites become favored. And so this points towards the, the idea that, um, well, yes, dissolution precipitation might be super important, but there's evidence that frictional slip and rapid dilation is occurring in these foliated serpentinites and could be a really important mechanism for deformation taking place. So that's the, the, the sort of the key message that uh, I have for this section of the talk. I'd like to finish up with something completely unrelated. So, uh, <laughs> For those of you who are interested in outreach or uh, perhaps even field teaching, I've been developing a project called Viewing the Rock World, which is based around a fully 3D printable, well, except for the polarizers, thin section viewer that allows you to view thin sections without any magnification, so they need to be coarse grained, um, using a device that you can make at home for under five dollars. And so if you're interested in this project, if you're in this phase of the project, I'm looking for people that are have the ability to print it themselves. Um, I'd like you to check out my website. I think it's also linked in the Meet the Speakers 
uh, portion of the uh, Serpentine Days. And uh, please feel free to reach out to me if it's something that you uh, might be interested in. Thank you. Um, so thanks for inviting me to talk today. I'm going to talk about um, the a project that I, I had uh, funded that I uh, call Serperate AI. Um, and uh, this this project um, has been a long time coming. There is the Norwegian Research Council decided to blow itself up and that extended the start date by like a year and a half. But now it's finally starting. So I'm quite excited about that. Um, Anyways, enough of my drama. Let's talk about science. Um, so I'm sure many of you, or perhaps even all of you, have uh, some familiarity with the idea that we can store carbon in um, uh, uh, in peridotites. Um, and uh, this idea is is no longer a, a new a new idea. Um, it's uh, uh, it's been around for you know since. Uh, I was an undergrad. So um, uh, uh, th this is uh, clearly going to solve, you know, present itself as one solution uh, to the ongoing uh, climate crisis. And um, one, one of the, 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 the things that I, I, I love to say in all these talks is this quote from Bjorn and Oyvind's uh, uh, book on, on this topic that the that, that it's a, 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 although many would regard such rates in terms of alteration for carbon storage as utopian fantasy, this raises the possibility of sequestering carbon and prototype at rates that are sufficient for long term geological storage of a significant fraction of the anthropogenic production. And I kind of like that quote because it, it, kind, it kind of is saying that, like, hey, you know, if we could capture all the carbon. We could keep burning coal for as long as we wanted, well, until we run out of coal. But um, that's a bit silly at, on the face of it. But um, the, the idea generally is that the more we can understand how well in situ uh, peridotite alters, the better we can understand how we can store carbon in that area. Um, and so you're probably all very familiar with what these peridotites look like. Um, and so here's just an example of an out crop in Oman, and you can see it has this like wonderful hierarchical uh, uh, network structure um, as observed by uh, Peter uh, Kellerman here. Um, and um, we and uh, uh, one big question that I, I think uh, that comes out of a lot of this is where did these come from? Uh, how does how does this alteration happen in the environment? And what's the, the kind of time evolution process? Because that would lead to a physical understanding of the alteration rates. And so if we kind of think about what our system is organized as, um, so uh, in this case, uh, this includes uh, the boreholes, one of the boreholes from the Oman drilling project, um, which is why there's this big well of water here, but uh, maybe that's not normally there. Um, but you can see that the there's a whole bunch of different systems that are going on. There's uh, fracturing, there's changing uh, pressure, temperature conditions, um, uh, that, that uh, uh, there's a, a fluid pressure changes, there's microbes producing gas, there's gas being produced by alteration. Um, uh, and this all is in the context of the existing um, like geology uh, that just exists wherever you find peridotite. Um, and then on top of this, you have like weather and, you know, basically you can keep adding and adding to this. Probably there's many systems that I'm not mentioning here that might have an outsized impact on how does ro rock actively alter, how does prototype actively alter in this system? Um, and so I, I, I'm sure many of you are familiar, um, the Oman drilling program was designed to kind of gather a, a large amount of data um, uh, to, to kind of investigate this. And there's been a number of papers that have come out here. And I, uh, this is an old slide. I should have added one of the, some of the papers that I've written. Anyways, um, the, the, the idea is that the, a lot of this, there's, there's been an enormous amount of data uh, gathered from the Oman drilling program. And you can see here, 
Um, just as an example, there's uh, televiewer data, CT scan data, um, an enormous amount of seismic data, um, and, and as well as uh, other kind of like uh, atmosphere pressure. There's also reanalysis data um, for like weather conditions and stuff like that. Um, and so at this point, I should explain to you that uh, I'm not um, a geologist. I said this in my comment on the previous talk, but um, I'm also not really a geoscientist. My background is in physics, but I work as um, uh, uh, it's it's all been doing uh, kind of machine learning um, and computational science on a number of different problems. Um, and so, as you can see here, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of di disciplines, uh, as well as uh, an enormous amount of data. Um, and so, like, what do you do with all of this? How do you put all of this together holistically? Um, and the answer is that I know how to use my computer. Um, so that's how I solve scientific problems. Um, I, I worked in a lab in undergrad and grounded a 10 amp circuit and started a fire. So after that, I just kind of switched to only using my computer. But um, it, it, so far, it's worked out pretty well. Um, so I, I would call myself generally a computational scientist. And I think computational science is separate from computer science. Um, and it's kind of separate from all the, the kind of discipline based um, computing that's been going on for the last few decades, um, in that it's kind of the amalgamation of how does a scientist use computers. And, and that's kind of summed up in both uh, in, in how, how do scientists use algorithms applied to data? How do they program and develop software around that? And what data do they use and how do they store it or organize it? Because all of these things at the, at the, the, um, at, at the ultimate uh, kind of goal, uh, all of these things interact. And so uh, something, you know, if all of your data is just stored in text files, that might limit you and what you can do uh, in the same way as if like you, you, only, you only know about linear regression, um, you're, 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 you're never gonna solve um, uh, uh, maybe a more sophisticated problem. Um, so in order to examine the Oman Ophiolite system with our computer, um, uh, I've kind of organized three separate uh, 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 pro uh, kind of projects here. Um, one is the automated data pipeline for ingesting the drilling data itself. Um, the second is the acoustic observation that we've made um, uh, with the hydrophone and geophone network. And third is kind of a holistic model of how do we get back to these kind of problems, uh, to the kind of like holistic view of how the system uh, evolves over time. And so from a computational science perspective, um, these data uh, can be broken down into image and text and time series data. Um, and so oftentimes um, you certainly can't I'm I'm certainly not an advocate of the idea that like a data scientist or a computational scientist doesn't need to understand the discipline to be able to do things. I think it's the opposite. It's like the 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 value added from the computational science component actually gives you um, the opportunity to learn about some topic that that will then be leveraged to keep working on that. But the idea here is that these can be organized um, into the kind of topics, and then we can kind of go out and look for tools to analyze them. Um, and so kind of a, a project overview, uh, again, uh, is just do fracture networks predict where alteration occurs, what governs fluid motion in the rock fluid environment, and what constrains prototype alterations. Um, and so to kind of look at fracture networks to begin with, this is probably, familiar to a lot of people, but the idea behind a hierarchical fracturing is that if we have some very simple, you know, grid of fractures and we pour some, you know, carbonated water on it, um, that these will alter and they'll perform smaller and smaller uh, fractures until we get to some, you know, uh, stable state where you, there's no more, there's either no more fluid or there's no more place for fluid to go because it's gone everywhere. Um, and this is kind of 
uh, if you remember the picture of Peter and the peridotite, this is kind of what you're looking at in that picture um, is these hierarchical networks. And these have been mapped uh, uh, in, uh, I think there's a citation in the, per, the peridotite slide from um, uh, I or uh, I don't remember his first name, but of 2008 or 2009. But these have been mapped in Norway and it's very like uh, interesting. Anyways, um, so in order to understand these networks, we have um, data from uh, borehole cores that were taken, and then these are the uh, these are the the, the wraparound images. Um, and, and in addition to this, we also have the drilling reports. Um, in fact, most of these drilling reports were written by Lata, so it's, so it's actually quite interesting now that um, I've. I've done what I'm about to explain that we've done. And, uh, uh, actually, one of my students did this, not me. Um, but the uh, uh, the the ideas uh, uh, that come out of it are quite interesting because she kind of can confirm them. But don't let me speak for you, Lata. Um, so the idea is that we can kind of take these images. So these are just the wraparound images of the whole core from the Oman drilling project. So it's 400. Uh, uh, meters uh, of various kinds of peridotites, um, and and we can image we can image uh, uh, we can take these images and we can segment them uh, using a tool called Elastic. Um, my student made a tutorial um, to tell you how to use this. If you don't know how to use it, it's very easy. It doesn't require any programming knowledge. Um, uh, but so, you know, this QR code can take you there. Um, and then using that segmented images, we can use kind of more statistical representations of the image and we can use more physically physical based uh, in, uh, representations of the image to try to un understand uh, a depth wise picture of how fractures have to, uh, or, or you could might say carbonate veins uh, in this case, um, how they the, the, the developed uh, in the rock at that place. Um, and so, yeah, so th uh, this is image and text data, right? Because we have these drilling reports that Lotta wrote. And these drilling reports, um, they say things like microcrystalline carbonate visible on vein surfaces, clasped are 90% angular and 10% rounded. This indicates that the thickness of alluvium is less than a few tens of centimeters and the bedrock is surfacing. To be honest, I kind of only understand that just a bit barely. It's not um, necessarily if you needed me to explain this uh, in a professional setting like the one I'm currently in, I can't really. Um, the Because I'm not a geologist, I don't really know what all of those words mean. Um, I can kind of guess, but that's 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 the extent of my knowledge. But what we can do uh, is we can assume that the person making this is an expert, and we can say, let's take this information that they wrote down, and see if we can segment it like the image, um, and and try to pull out keywords from it that might be indicative of what's going on per depth, because these uh, drilling reports are written. Uh, per more or less meter uh, out of the 400 meters of core. Um, and so we take all of this, we stick them in the chat GPT and we ask our um, the chat GPT to pick out uh, keywords from every meter, uh, uh, from every report, from every meter. So you get um, or, or, you know around 400, uh, 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 you get 400, 400 reports turn into 400 sets of keywords um, and chat GPT also gives you an explanation for each keyword and then we just turn these into binary variables so that we can stick them into a regression model um, and uh, and so these get uh, filtered as well so sometimes you have only one or two uh, instances so that's not enough for a regression model so we limit them and I, I think at the end we had like 50 keywords um, so if you take all of these uh, together, you take the statistical representations of fractures uh, per depth, the network connectivity, um, which is a physical representation of how fractures are, are organized uh, in the rock. And then you take the GPT uh, keyword extraction, i.e. 
the summer the summarization of the expert knowledge of lata and we stick these all into uh, our machine learning model we can then predict the alteration rate um, that seen that was visually seen um, in uh, the core um, and so when we do that we uh, if you don't know how to read an roc curve um, the idea is that the area under this curve is good so the more area under the curve the better uh, if this looked like um, an L, or I guess not really an L, I guess it's kind of an L, but you know, on its side, um, then uh, if it was a right angle here, then that would be perfect. Uh, usually perfect is bad, uh, uh, but uh, the uh, but you want something slightly less than perfect, um, uh, which you could put, in, in, uh, I won't diverge from there. Um, but so the idea is that this model is predicting uh, how much alteration there is per meter of core. Uh, uh, and it's using both the, the image that was segmented into fractures and then derived into further representations of those fractures, and also the summaries of Lotha's expertise. Um, and uh, what we see is that the model um, first has depth is the most important variable, which we would all assume that depth is quite important uh, to how uh, how much alteration is occurring. Um, the second is the the minerals that are involved, um, and and it kind of goes down through fractures, connectivity, and then there's other stuff that just doesn't seem to relate much to it. And so what we have here is um, a, a project that was done completely by a student um, that. Uh, wh whose background was in uh, electrical engineering. He came and did a summer internship with me. Um, and uh, uh, he had basically no ge geology or petrology background. Um, and he was able to produce a, 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 a kind of an expert driven model that has that can be confirmed um, uh, through um, uh, conversations with like uh, Lata and other people who uh, gathered this data uh, to kind of produce uh, a, a very uh, holistic view of what the uh, depth-wise alteration is in the core. Um, so uh, next I'm going to, so anyways, that's pretty interesting. Um, we're writing this up now. Uh, he's he's submitting this as his thesis and we'll turn try to turn his thesis into a paper. So feel free to review it um, if you get called to do so. Um, so the next is we're going to talk about some fluid motion in the rock fluid environment. So uh, you're probably familiar with the image that looks similar to this. Um, the idea behind a reaction driven cracking system is that there should be some um, uh, 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 fluid in some kind of pore space that's interacting with unaltered uh, rock that rock uh, alters. Uh, and then the uh, rock happens to expand in volume when it alters. Um, and that creates stress, which uh, promotes the crack to grow. And so this uh, kind of uh, uh, alteration will probably produce uh, hydrogen, uh, and it also will produce uh, an earthquake. Um, well, a micro earthquake in any case. Um, and the idea is that we should both hear uh, micro earthquakes, and if there's gas moving in the system, we should hear bubbles as they're, you know, moving around. Um, and so, in order to do this, there is both a geophone and hydrophone network deployed. Um, this is 100 meters across. You can see here in this picture how close they are. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to look at BA1B data, um, which is this this borehole here. Uh, and we're not going to look at geophone data or BA1A data today, but that's on the agenda. Um, and so you, there's six hydrophones on the cable uh, down to 400 or, or almost 400 meters. Um, and they were deployed for nine months and had and they have a real high sampling rate, 1,000 hertz. Um, and so, the, you know, the original idea was that we wanted to find cracks, right? Because the, it, the, the presentation of um, data uh, of in situ evidence of reaction driven cracking would really be like a smoking gun that 
Oman is an actively uh, altering environment. And then we can measure like peridotite alteration rates. And then we can say, well, this is how much CO2 you can store here. And then everyone gets excited because, I don't know, some oil and gas company swoops in and buys up every all the land and injects all the CO2 and the, the, the world's problems are solved. Um, but what, uh, so when we kind of looked at BA1B, um, we were quite excited in the beginning because when you look at the spectrogram, you see these days where you see what looks like cracking events, um, uh, which are these days where you have this like broad uh, spectrum uh, experiences. Um, yeah, and I, I won't talk about, there's all sorts of other interesting stuff in the spectrogram, but we won't talk about that. But when you go and you look at the events that are occurring on these kind of broad uh, uh, spectrum days, um, you see that the events are actually, well, this is kind of cut off for some reason, but the events here uh, that we detect in these days are about 0.2 seconds long. And the earthquakes that we detect are around one second long. So already that's kind of like a, a 0.2 second earthquake is really sh short. And second, the waveform doesn't really look right. Um, it's kind of missing um, the characteristics you would imagine in um, to see in a uh, 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 in, in a waveform data. Um, and so uh, what we decided is that this um, going, you, you can match uh, this wavelet to um, uh, a laboratory data. And this wavelet looks a lot like a bubble nucleating. Um, and, uh, and what you see here is that actually this isn't, this is a bubble uh, nucleating and then producing a wave that travels down the borehole, reflects off the bottom, and then travels up to the top. Um, and you can see it even bounces uh, back and forth. And in some cases, you can see this bounce seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times. It's actually pretty impressive that uh, the system is uh, so efficient um, uh, that it can do that for, you know, kilometers of water. But um, anyways, so th the idea now is that like the, what we're detecting here are not actually cracks, but actually fl uh, a fluid or, 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 or rather gas moving around in the system, but moving into the borehole from the host rock system. And so what we see is we see this like decaying process of gas coming out and coming out in episodic events. And what we would think is that maybe, oh, well, of course, you know, you drilled a borehole, of course, that's going to like open up some uh, avenues of escape. But, um, uh, and, and while I think it certainly did, um, the, the, the hydrophones were deployed like a year and a half after the, the borehole was uh, cored. So, um, I, 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 while that is certainly the reason why there's a space for gas to flow into now, we can't assume that it's due, that the gas that the gas differential uh, was directly caused by uh, the coring of the hole. So it could be from some other process. Um, so what's next? Uh, I, I, I want to get back to this kind of holistic view because I, I made a huge pitch for it and then I kind of segmented the project into a bunch of different things. Um, and there's a lot of things, there's a lot of different ways we can look at this system. And right now I've kind of, I've started to, so, so in addition to um, the degassing, I've also been looking at fracturing that we've detected, but that fracturing ends up being borehole breakouts. Um, but I didn't want to talk about that today, um, but that's in preparation as well. Um, uh, but so as you can see, there's a lot of different things that are happening here. And what would be nice is to have some kind of, of model that uh, 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 that kind of takes in all of this data and then in, and then can do the inversion that we want to see to estimate this kind of like alteration rate. Um, and so, uh, in addition to the kind of things that I do um, on this Serpate AI project, I also work on a project called 4D Modeler. Um, uh, that's in collaboration. Uh, with the company I work at, um, Njord Center, um, which is the university I work at, Utrecht, where I'm a guest, and University of Bristol and uh, uh, Technical University of Munich. And this is a, a Bayesian hierarchical model um, 
that is able to uh, uh, model um, complex physical uh, environments. It was originally developed to model um, all the different physical processes that lead to sea level rise, um, specifically because sea level rise, uh, a, a large amount of sea level rise does not come from uh, uh, water flowing into the sea. It comes from uh, uh, both the, the, the thermal expansion of the ocean and the glacial isostatic adjustment of the crust rising up um, from the retreat of the, the, the ice caps. Um, and so understanding all of these kind of processes are is important and and we've applied this to uh, other problems now as well um, and developed the model further to make it a lot more easier to use for uh, new people um, and for me uh, since I'm one of the primary users of it um, but so we've been working on this for the past year and we'll have a hackathon about that soon um, and so uh, one thing that I want to say is so, so anyways the idea is that this model can do spatiotemporal modeling. And what that means is that we can we can give the model data and it can talk about the time evolution of, of the physical process that we believe the model uh, is 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 a, is is measuring uh, and then calculate the uncertainties for these processes. And I'm not going to go into all the details because it's the end of the talk, it's not the beginning of the talk. Um, but anyways, this is uh, the, the future, I, I think, or at least part of it. Um, so one thing that you might have noticed is that Lata introduced me as talking about AI and machine learning and all sorts of stuff like that. And um, but I didn't I may not have given a talk that um, to me at least looks like a, a common physical sciences machine learning talk. Um, and and that's because like I, 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 I uh, I see machine learning is like building a lab apparatus. And what do I mean by that? Well, the thing is, is that building a model is uh, is only one of the steps in doing science. Um, building a machine learning model is only one of the steps. In, 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 and so if you build a, a lab apparatus, if it's particularly novel, um, then you might write a paper about it or more than one paper about it, but you might also build a lab apparatus that um, is not particularly novel, but you can do novel things with. Um, and so I think most uh, physical science right now is in a place um, to be using a kind of off the shelf or, or somewhat off the shelf machine learning tools um, as part of their lab apparatus uh, uh, of investigating uh, whatever it is they want to investigate um I, I don't think that the that that there needs to be an enormous amount of algorithm development in comparison to just uh kind of like tooling up the existing infrastructure um and so that's kind of my spiel about things um so anyways uh uh thanks for um uh, 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 coming to my talk. Um, so I just want to like make a call out to Elliot. He was the student who did all the chat GPT and um, image analysis stuff, and he was wonderful. So if uh, you ever see him uh, apply for something, please hire him. And um, the rest are all, you know, older, more well-established people who I won't uh, introduce because you probably know them. Um, anyways, thanks for having me.